All right, well, if you're visiting with us, we've been making our way, uh, we're towards the, the back part, but we've been making our way through a book entitled The Life and Death of Mr. Badman. It's just a, a fictional story uh, about this man whom, you guessed it, is bad, as his name suggests. He's a bad man, uh, and we've been, through his life, seeing, from the author's words, the footsteps to hell uh, in, in this sinful life of this man named Badman as Mr. Wise tells the story of bad man to Mr. Attentive, and in that we've been able to, you know, focus on different sins addressed from the Word of God and, uh, and to see why they're wicked and then what to do about them. Because in the Christian life, that's what we've been called to do. We've been called to put sin to death and to correct sinful thinking and sinful patterns of life with righteous uh, patterns of thinking and righteous patterns of life, right? In, in Scripture, we've been called to put the old man to death and to put on the new. And so that's what we've been looking at in, in this, and Continuing in this, this evening, you recall our last time together, uh, we finished a rather lengthy section in which we have been discussing different aspects of how to deal with our finances and conduct business faithfully before our God. Uh, really, in looking back at all of that, we really just need to understand and grasp, church, if we don't already, uh, that there is no part of our lives, there's no part of our lives at all in which we are not accountable to our Creator. He has created us in His image to image and reflect who He is here on His creation. And so, of course, that means that how we use our money, how we use our finances is important to God. You know, the, how we use our finances is not some separate issue uh, apart from our service to God. Uh, it's included in, in all of our life and all of our service to the Lord. All of, every aspect is important. Uh, the earth is the Lord's. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, Psalm 24, verse 1, uh, which means that our money, how we use our money and also how we obtain it, how we use it, how we obtain it, is all under God's creator authority, and we are to use it and steward it well as he would have us. Uh, ultimately, our money, in the grand scheme of things, our money is his money uh, that he has given us to use in righteousness to his glory uh, out of love for him and love for our neighbor. And so along with that, as we saw last Wednesday, uh, when it comes to our business dealings, we are not to be those who extort people or swindle people from their money and their possessions. Let us be reminded, church, that swindlers, uh, those who live that kind of lifestyle in deception and taking advantage of others for our own personal gain, uh, hating others, lying to others, and so forth for our own personal gain, swindlers will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 and 10. Amongst many sinful lifestyles listed there, swindlers, thieves, the greedy, will not inherit the kingdom of God. They will inherit, those who live that life will inherit the second death and the lake of fire, where they will suffer under the wrath of God for eternity in loving themselves and, and seeking themselves over God and neighbor. Church, we who have been reconciled to our Creator, made new in Christ, uh, we are, on the other hand, to conduct ourselves in integrity. We are to do business in integrity. You remember, that's whether we're buying or whether we're selling, we are to do business in integrity. Uh, Leviticus 25, verse 14. Uh, Leviticus 25, 14, if you make a sale to your neighbor or buy from your neighbor, you shall not wrong one another. You shall not wrong one another in a buy or uh, a sale. Along with that, you recall Wise's words that we read as he spoke to Attentive on this issue. From the narrative, Wise told Mr. Attentive, quite simply put, if you're selling something, don't overhype your product. And if you're buying from another, don't devalue theirs. Regardless of whether you're buying or selling, offer a fair evaluation of the product's worth. To knowingly do anything otherwise is to have a greedy and wicked mind. Why else would a seller overvalue his product and a buyer undervalue another's? It's like claiming a product is worthless in order to negotiate down the price and then turning around and bragging about the steal you got. That's a quotation of Proverbs 20, 14. Bad, bad, says the buyer. And then he boasts as he leaves. And he says, and now because of greed and a desire to deceive the seller you become guilty of lying too. Likewise, it's wicked for the seller to enhance their product to make it appear more valuable than it really is. We can say the same for the buyer who devalues what he wants using cunning or deceitful <coughs> comments to drive down the price. Close quote. And of course, though this may be common in our day, church, that doesn't matter. It, it is wrong. Uh, it is sinful to do so. Uh, we are not, as we've mentioned several times, we're not to be those who are simply seeking our own interests. God did not create us for that in his image, and much more as Christians, he did not redeem us for that, to just seek our own interests. 
We're to be those who conduct ourselves in integrity in all aspects of our life, out of love for God and of love for neighbor, right? Actually seeking the, the upbuilding of those around us and not seeking to deceive with lies and tear down and take from, steal. We're not to take uh, part in the unfruitful works of darkness, Ephesians 5.11, but instead we are to expose them. We're not to take part in them, we're to expose them. We're to walk in the light as our Lord is in the light. And thus, if the shoe fits in any way, brethren, if the shoe fits in any way, may we put it on, tie the laces, and confess our sin and repent. Repent where need be. Uh, may we turn from not loving neighbor as we ought. And as Zacchaeus modeled for us in Luke 19, may we make it right to them that we have defrauded in our own lives. Remember when Zacchaeus repented, he, I'm not saying you have to do exactly this. He said, half the money I give to the poor, and if I defrauded anyone, I restore it fourfold. I'm not saying you necessarily have to restore it fourfold, but you, you need to make it right. That's what repentance involves. If I wrong someone, repentance doesn't just involve, okay, I'm, you know, I'm sorry, God, forgive me. It involves making it right with the person I've wronged, going to them and, and restoring that which we broke. So we need to repent and make it right if the shoe fits. But if you're not in Christ this evening, if you're not in Christ this evening, in rebellion to your Creator, may you repent. May you entrust yourself to Christ while God has given you time. Uh, may you use this time right now that God has sovereignly given you while you're still in rebellion to Him, while you're living in love of your own opinions and in hatred of Him, not believing upon Christ, not obeying His command to repent. May you use this time wisely this evening. And in that, may you look at how hopeless you are in and of yourself. May you repent. May you turn and look to Him who is the foundation and giver of all truth, life, blessedness, righteousness, true joy, and peace, and all things wonderful. Uh, which you do not have whatsoever apart from him. You do not have those things apart from Christ. You do not have true joy. You do not have you know, all things wonderful. You do not have true blessedness, peace, or anything. You have the facade of that, uh, which will fade away along with this world, this rebellious world system fades away. So may you turn to Christ and live while God has given you time. May you turn from a worthless life and seeking your own interests to a life of purpose and loving your God and neighbor in truth. And then getting back into the narrative this evening, in our section tonight, we will begin, uh, begin to cover the sin of pride as it is seen in a bad man's life. Uh, this evening, really looking broadly at what pride is and the different aspects of how pride can be seen in our thinking and, and in our living this evening. So we read that as they had uh, talked so much about the wickedness of bad man, why certainly understood attentive's desire to move on to the man's death, as they would soon get to, but there were still a few more things about his life to be made known. And Wise would begin with the man's pride. Wise states, and I quote from the narrative, Well, bad man was prideful. Very prideful. Most times he was so terribly prideful and condescending to others, he, he could convey a look that said, Don't contradict or oppose me. He considered himself more intelligent, more competent, and more attractive than any other man in the country, and he loved to brag on himself and to hear others praise him. He couldn't stand for anyone to think they were better than him, or smarter, or popular. He was somewhat cordial with his equals, but he looked down with great contempt on the lower class. And if at any time he had to socialize with them, those of the lower class, he was quite the snob, with a domineering attitude, because certainly he was better than them in his mind. Why says, I think Solomon summed up bad man best, and he quotes Proverbs 21, 24 here. Proverbs 21, 24. He says, I think, I think Solomon summed up bad man best when referring to his kind as a mocker whose arrogance and conceit knows no bounds. Bad man never thought his food was good enough. Never thought his food was good enough. He never thought his clothes were made fine enough or his praise refined enough. His praise was never refined enough. Close quote. And of course he didn't because he was full of himself. He was full of pride, arrogance, which biblically means he was full of himself. I mean, I'm sure you can define pride or arrogance or haughtiness. Those are synonymous terms. I'm sure you can define that in different ways, but biblically understood, it is simply love of self over love of God. Uh, a, a, a love of self over love of God over truth. You think too highly of yourself than you ought. You think more of yourself than you do your creator and what is true. And certainly that then shows forth in how you think about life and how it's to be lived and, and how you interact with others and so forth. Right? Because in any way that we're thinking that shows forth. 
But when we're thinking too much of ourselves, it definitely shows forth in how we're thinking about life, how we want to live, the decisions in our life, how we talk to people, or how we don't talk to people. And so, uh, Proverbs 18, verses 11 to 13, just to show you a, an illustration of pride. Proverbs 18, verse 11 to 13, says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. But a richest man's wealth is his strong city, and like a high wall in his imagination. Before destruction, a man's heart is haughty or prideful, but humility comes before honor. And so with this imagery here, and speaking of what pride in a man's heart leads to, we see that the prideful are not those who run into the strong tower of the name of the Lord. They're not like the righteous who run into the name of the Lord. He does that and, and is safe. But they're not those who are entrusting themselves to him to follow that which their Lord and creator would have for their life. But they trust in themselves, the prideful do, the wicked. They trust in themselves. Their confidence is in what they can do. Their confidence is in what they can perceive and think about life themselves, what they can reason about life itself and how it should be lived. Because in their mind, they are their own God instead of their creator. This is all unbelievers. They are their own God. They are the master of their destiny. And church, such selfish, prideful thinking, haughty thinking, uh, never leads to true life, but only destruction. And not just eternal destruction, but the destruction and death of many things in their life as well, uh, of the ones who live like this, right? The destruction of God's revealed design for their life in rejecting God's truth and wanting to live in a way that is uh, pleasing in their sight, a way that seems right to them, a, a prideful way. God's revealed design for their life in different ways is going to be destroyed. Uh, depending on whether they're a man or a woman, they're not going to be a, a, a true man or woman as God has defined. They're not going to be a husband, a, a wife, the way that God has designed. Many ways in which God has designed for their life to function in his image is going to be destroyed by their pride and rebellion. The destruction of relationships in their life because they just want to do what they want to do. And so that's going to cause destruction of relationships of just seeking your own interests and not loving one another and seeking the interest of others. The destruction of the very image of God they're created in. And thus, along with that, the destruction of true joy, peace, contentment, and proper thinking about life. All of these things are destroyed by pride. Thinking too highly of ourselves and that we can come up with these things instead of he who has created us and given us truth in his word. And church, it's because of their pride and thinking too highly of themselves, delighting in different ways in the glory of man rather than the glory of God, that they find themselves in this truly unsatisfying and destructive condition of life. As we who have been converted can all testify to God has shown us that um, by his grace to turn from sin unto him, to find satisfaction in him and in him alone, to find true life in him. Just as the proverb mentions pride with the rich man, church, we'll hear from bad man, all we, all we see really is, is one aspect of how pride is shown, uh, with pride being seen in just a very outward way, a very boastful way, a very uh, braggadocious way, right? Bad man's very condescending. Uh, he, he, he thinks he's better than everyone else. His food is never good enough. His clothes are not uh, fine enough. His, his praise is never refined enough. He's better than you. He's, he's, uh, he's more attractive than you. All these things. This very braggadocious, uh, outward, external way of showing pride. But church, you know, the Bible does show other ways that pride is seen as well. It's not just seen in just that way. Many times that's the way we think about pride. But there's other ways that, that pride is, is seen. And I, I think that becomes clear uh, once you once you bring that out, but from the very definition of pride, there's different ways that we show that we love ourselves more than God, just in uh, you know outward and external ways and so forth. Pride isn't always that. Uh, it can also be seen, church, from those who turn in on themselves and are very often thinking in a very introspective sort of way. Uh, they're what many would call today just very introverted people. And many times these people will get a pass on not really ever wanting to be around large groups of people. Uh, or, you know, just kind of wanting to be by themselves all the time and secluding themselves from others. Or this can also be seen from those who may seem down and depressed and so forth more often. You know, th this person is not just, con they're, they're not content with their life. And so from that, they act this way towards others as well. Because they're not content in life and they're down, they act this way towards others as well, just in a secluded way. Then they want to be by themselves uh, really more than anything. They want to always be by themselves. And in how much of us have been shepherded to see personality traits as justifications for sinful behavior, many times if you try to talk to these about it, uh, they may get mad at you for not being more understanding towards them, 
We're not being more understanding because, you know, this is just how they are. I'm just this way, and, and you're imposing yourself on me. You're, you're wanting to call me to be something that I'm not and so forth. Uh, but honestly, church, that's just the flip side of outward pride. That's just the flip side of, of external pride because you're still thinking too highly of yourself than you ought. You're delighting in how you feel in the moment over your God and his truth and how he would have you think and live in the circumstance. And thus in that mindset, you're either mistreating others around you, you're mistreating others around you, or you're not actively seeking to love others as God has commanded you because you're seeking your own interest. You're not actively seeking to love others around you. And again, it's because you're too caught up in yourself. You're too caught up in just focusing on how you feel and your problems instead of focusing outward on loving God and loving neighbor as we ought in accordance with the truth. So Proverbs 18, verse 1. Proverbs 18, verse 1 says, Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. Now, isn't that prideful? That's what pride is. Seeking your own desire. Thinking of yourself too highly. Being haughty, high-minded of you and your own opinion and your perception about life. That is what pride is. Seeking your own desire. So it's not just seen from the outward and boasting again, but it's also seen from those who seclude in different ways. So think about this. Uh, well, you know, I don't know about going to evangelize with the church because I'm just really introverted. And I don't really like being around large groups of people. And conversing with someone in that way does not sound comfortable to me. And so I, I don't know if I should go do that because that's, that's just how I am. I don't know if I would be any, any help in that and so forth. So, so I think I should just not do that because of my personality trait there. Or, or even in that, I, I heard in, uh, in evangelism from professing Christians that they don't go to church because they don't like being around large groups of people. It makes them uncomfortable, and so they don't go to church, even though the Lord commands it in his word. Uh, but either way it goes, that is pride. That's, that's pride. That's seeking your own desire. That's not doing what God commanded you to do. That's doing what you, you want to do. That's, that's following a way that seems right to you and your feelings. The fact that someone may not like to be around a large group of people, beloved, or, or whatever excuse uh, someone may make for disobeying their professed Lord is, in fact, not an excuse at all. It's not an excuse at all. There is no justification for sin. Just because we feel a certain way is not an excuse to sin. And in such a case, you're simply isolating yourself in different aspects when biblically, as a Christian, you've been called to actively love others as Christ has loved you. You've been called, for example, in evangelism, we've been called to make disciples in different ways. We've been called to proclaim the gospel. We've been called to proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And I don't get a, a pass on not doing that just because I feel uncomfortable around you know, doing that. So, and so I just want to seclude and isolate myself. We've been called to actively love others. Uh, we've been called here in the church to, to love the brethren here as Christ has loved us unwaveringly, regardless of how we feel, uh, in the truth. We've been called to not neglect together, uh, to gather together, as is the habit of some, but to encourage one another all the more as we see the day draw near. As Christians, that command is upon us in the local church. And, of course, those are just a few examples of the commands that we are to follow towards one another. But to not obey them, to not obey them and then blame a personality trait or some type of sinful disposition of attitude that we may have, uh, on our disobedience to God, it is just absolutely ridiculous, and it does not negate our sin at all. It does not negate our sin. Uh, you've been called to love me, church. You've been called to love me actively in the truth, regardless of how you feel. I've been called to do the same towards you. I've been called to love you regardless of how I feel. Uh, and to not do so is private. It's private. Uh, seeking my own desires rather than my God's. And then I'm secluding myself away from you and my responsibilities towards you as a fellow image bearer of God and a redeemed brother or sister in the Lord. So church, I've, you know, I've heard from different people at times who will say something along the lines of, you know, that they just need to take a break from church so that they can focus on them. You know, I just need to take a break from the body just to focus on me. And, you know, they're going through, they'll bring, they'll bring, bring out that they're, I'm going through some hard times. You know, it's difficult now. Uh, and you want to be understandable in that, sure. You, you don't want to just pass that off. Um, but this person, they just want to take a break from the body so that they can focus on them. They're going through a tough time. and It's just amazing how that kind of logic in our honestly weak church culture uh, is accepted. Because that, that is pride. That, that is what that is. That is pride. 
Uh, you're so focused on you that you're willing to just abandon and neglect God's sheep. Does he do that? Does Christ do that? Does the good shepherd do that? He defines the hired hand as the person who does that. They get uncomfortable and they, they flee the sheep because they're a hired hand. You're so focused on you that you're willing to just abandon and neglect God's sheep. You're so focused on you that you're willing to abandon the many means of grace that God uses to bring you through tough times. Fellowship with the church, iron sharpening iron, teaching one another how to obey all that Christ commanded. You're willing to abandon the elders, which is a, a, a cornerstone in the life of a biblical believer to be equipped for the work of the ministry. God has given strong, mature men to help guide you through these times. You, you want to abandon that so that you can try to get through a tough time by your own strength. Maybe when you put it that way, it gets a little more clear, but it makes no sense. It makes no sense to think that way, and it comes from pridefully seeking our own desire. It's just the, op uh, the, the opposite side of the outward form of it. It's still pride. It's just inwardly. It's shown inwardly instead of outwardly braggadocious and so forth. It's loving yourself over God. Uh, and then furthermore, church, uh, since this is what pride is, I mean, you really could say that there's pride shown any time we're not functioning as we ought. Any time we sin, there's pride shown. Actually, you know, when you get down to the basis of it, anytime we sin, there's pride being shown. And that is individually or corporately together as a church. Uh, brethren, th think about this. Think about what the Apostle Paul called the church in, in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 5 for having not disciplined the man who was being immoral, sexually immoral with his stepmother. Think about what he called them. He called them arrogant. He called them prideful for not exercising church discipline. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 1 to 2. He says, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and he says, and you're arrogant, and, and you're haughty in this, you're prideful in this. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. And why are they arrogant? Well, it's, they're not being arrogant or prideful because they're being overbearing or something, because they're being braggadocious and, and, and boastful and, and uh, condescending or domineering towards this man. That's not why they're being arrogant. You could actually see it being implied that they probably think they're being pretty loving and nice. Uh, like many churches today, and just allowing this person to continue on in sin around them and, you know, just maybe praying for them but never actually addressing the sin. But Paul tells them they're being prideful. He tells them they're being arrogant. And why? Well, it's because they're not doing what God would have them or any true biblical church do in such a situation. They're doing what they want to do. They're not doing what God would have them do because God would have them put the man out of the membership for his glory, for the good of the church, and for the sake of that man's soul. He would have them put them out of the membership in loving accountability and discipline, uh, lovingly and humbly calling them to repent because no one walking in sexual immorality will enter the kingdom of God. And so while there may be many professing churches around here in this, all of them that do not seek to hold their members to Christ's commands and loving discipline are actually prideful and arrogant professing churches who need to repent of following their own desires instead of Christ. And they need to love their people as Christ has called them to love. I pray they do. We all should pray they do. Because if church, a true revival is actually going to happen and, and this wicked culture is going to be transformed by the glorious gospel, it's going to need to be held accountable as well by loving, corrective discipline and local churches. It must be. Because a gospel message without church accountability will only lead to hypocrisy. A little leaven leavens a whole lump. That's, that's Bible. we got to cut it off or it will spread like Dan Green. A God, a, even, a, even a good, solid gospel message, apart from a proper church discipline and accountability, that will turn into hypocrisy. Uh, sin will spread in the church and be, because it won't be being put up with, or it will be being put up with. It won't be being dealt with. And, you know, I, I wanted us to see that, church, because it's necessary to see pride in its full array. Uh, it can appear in different forms. But at the heart of it, it, it's a heart that just wants to do what seems right to it, uh, a heart that wants to seek its own desire. And so anytime we sin, we're being prideful. Uh, we're being haughty and not walking humbly as our God would have us and simply trusting in him and submitting as his creations to how, uh, to how we ought to think and live in the lives he has given us, to how he would have us think and live in the lives he's given us. And our pride, any time we sin, even as believers, we're showing that in those times we're functionally loving ourselves over God. In those times when we sin, we're functionally loving ourselves over God. Though certainly in all, we would not say that, that we are as the wicked and we do love ourselves over God. Certainly Christ is our greatest treasure. But in those times, 
we are functionally loving ourselves over God. And praise God that in those times he doesn't leave us there. Amen? Amen. Praise God he doesn't leave us there. Praise God that he who begins a good work completes it. Praise God that he's given us a new heart in Christ that is no longer stony towards him and that wants to be sanctified and further conformed into the image of Christ. Because on the flip side of that, church, back to uh, what we mentioned in the narrative of bad man's more outward pride, that is why bad man was the way that he was. That's why he was condescending to others. That's why he spoke bad and down to others, was domineering, didn't worry about what they thought. That's why he thought he was better than everyone else in every way, loved to brag on himself and have others praise him. Why? Because he is his favorite person. Uh, not anyone else, not his creator, him. And in that, he's just like everyone else on the world apart from Christ. He's like every unbeliever. At the heart. In the heart, he's just like every unbeliever. And yet, it certainly shows different in different people's lives. It shows different, sure. But at the heart, apart from Christ, we're all uh, just prideful through and through. At the heart of it, we're just pridefully seeking to live in a way, to live life in a way that seems right to us. And in closing, I know I didn't get too much in the actual narrative this evening, but we'll come back and, and finish the rest of it next time, Lord willing. Uh, Wise actually does say some very interesting comments about how we dress, and he discusses physical enhancements in that, uh, along with pride, where you know, I, I don't necessarily like word for word agree with everything he says in there, but it does bring up uh, opportunity for good conversation uh, to speak of that. So we'll, we'll look at that next time. But in what we've discussed this evening, brothers and sisters, Children, this evening, what we've discussed, I pray that pride and the putting of death to pride is something that by God's grace we all seek to do, because it is a deadly thing that will in different ways truly destroy the lives of those who walk in it. You know, think of the arguments that we can get into at times, or, you know, children, think of the arguments that you can get in. Think of the ways that you can talk to one another at times when you don't get your way. Someone's not thinking about something the way you want them to think about it. Someone's not doing or... Uh, playing a game, or whatever, just any aspect, that someone's not functioning the way that you want them to function. Uh, families, parents, spouses, husbands, wives, fathers, mothers. Think about how we can talk to one another in our home sometimes when we don't get our way. But how we can do that. Why is that? Pride. It's because of pride. James chapter 4, verse 1. What causes quarrels? What, what causes fights among you? <coughs> what causes this? Why are there quarrels among you? Why are there fights among you? He says, is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? Your, your sinful passions, your selfish passions, they're at war within you? He says, you desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and you cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. Because you're just all about you. You're pointing the finger at the other person, but it's really you and your pride. You're not getting your way. Thinking too highly of ourselves, and in that moment, we think everyone needs to function the way we should have them function. And so when they don't, we lash out in anger in some type of way. It's not their fault at all. It's not that person's fault at all. It's simply our selfish and sinful pride showing forth towards them. Uh, as we read earlier, before destruction, before destruction, church, a man's heart is haughty, it's prideful, but humility leads to honor. Humility leads to honor. So brothers and sisters, in entrusting ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ and loving our God through him, by the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells within May we humbly seek to love one another as God would have us in, in accordance with his commands. May we seek to have peace with one another in as much as it depends upon us. Right? Individually and corporately, may Christ and his word reign over our hearts and minds. The word of the living God reads in Isaiah 66, verse 1 to 2. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me? What is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made, and so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. He's saying, look, I, I don't need anything. I don't, I don't even need you. I made all this. What is the place that you would give to me? There's nothing you can give me where I would have to owe you something in return. I own everything. I made it all. He says, but in light of that fact, he says, this is the one to whom I will look, and it's presumably with favor. I, this is the one that I will look with favor. He who is humble, not the prideful. This is the one whom, whom the Lord God, the eternal God, Father, Son, and Spirit, looks at with favor, though he needs nothing. He who is humble and contrite, broken in spirit, contrite in spirit, and who trembles at my word. Humble, contrite in spirit, and who trembles at my word. 
If you do not tremble at his word this evening, may you examine yourself, be honest with yourself, think about how important life truly is, and may by the grace of God you put pride down and humble yourself before your God. Tremble at his word and cling to Christ and live while God has given you time. And if you're in Christ this evening, brother and sister, may you continue to tremble at his word. May you continue to fight the good fight. And in beholding the beauty and sufficiency of our great God and Savior, may we all be quick repenters and confessors of sin. When our thoughts sinfully rise above and pridefully thinking too highly of ourselves, then we ought. And as we'll continue in this conversation on pride next time, uh, apart from any comments or questions, we can begin our review.